Hey all, just a quick introduction here before we jump into the recording of this webinar. I was recently invited back to Lyndon Nichols Happiness Hour to actually co-host a presentation with my good friend John Fisher. And we did a little bit of a Photoshop versus Lightroom classic, uh, not battle per se, but kind of comparison of how we approach our workflows in each of those programs from an editing standpoint for our nature photography. Now, obviously you're gonna be watching the recording here on my channel. I would definitely encourage you to go over to the Happiness Hour channel as well. I'll link it down below. Linda's been doing this since the early pandemic days. And basically, I think she's only missed a few weeks. So she's got a good three years of content now. It's all free. It happens every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time here in the U.S. I'll also link to her site so you can see her upcoming guest schedule. So I definitely encourage you to go over there, subscribe to the channel, try to join in the sessions for free if you can. Again, they're every Wednesday. And they cover everything, not just nature photography, but street photography, macro photography, wildlife, portraiture, anything and everything. She's had topics covered. And with that out of the way, let's just get to the webinar. Hello everyone, I'm Linda Nichol and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week photographers meet here to connect, inspire, and create. My guests share their tips, infuse creativity, and inspire us to look at the world a little differently. The schedule for upcoming presentations is on my website at Linda Nichol. Dot com, as well as the links to previous sessions on the Happiness Hour YouTube channel. Tonight's guests are John Fisher and Michael Rung. Both John and Michael are nature and landscape photographers based in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Their interest in photography forged a friendship that has taken them to many national parks and off-the-grid public lands in their adventure treks. They are a couple of talented photographers and agree on most things related to making pictures, except their approaches to post-processing their photographs. In tonight's presentation, Nature Photography Editing Workflows, John will demonstrate his approach using Photoshop, while Michael will show how he edits solely in Lightroom Classic. If you're on Instagram, you can find John at jfisherphotography and through his website, johnpfisher.com and michael is on instagram at michael rung photography you can subscribe to his michael rung photography youtube channel and you can always reach him through his website michaelrungphotography.com welcome back to the happiness hour guys thanks linda thank you very much <laughs> it's great this to be here <laughs> i hope i don't regret this <laughs> You won't, I promise. Um, I, okay, so I, we, I, before we hit record, this is something that I wanted to do a long time ago because um, I've seen John edit photos while we were on a trip and he plays around in his little Photoshop world and it blows me away. And the work he produces is amazing. And Michael, because I spend more of my time in, in Lightroom, I kind of enjoy um watching your youtube channel and just kind of though i kind of and i'm gonna say this because you dumb it down for people like me um i'm not technical but you're very good at explaining things maybe some things i don't need to know but you explain them where it, it makes sense and it's it's easy to apply to some of the stuff i want to do so i'm glad to have you both here um I told you guys to come early so we can talk about a plan. And Michael's response is like, oh, you're expecting a plan. So I don't know <laughs> what I'm going to get. And um, I've been working on my editing skills with videos. So I will probably have to use them tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, you guys go ahead and start. All right, John. So speaking of our grand plan, you said you want me to go first. Yes, that would be fantastic. All right. And then I'll follow in your footsteps. Uh, you'll try. <laughs> and so it begins. Okay. So obviously, as Linda said, I'm I'm very much a Lightroom Classic diehard, partly through stubbornness, partly, partly through just my own personal style. I don't do a lot of really fancy over-the-top processing. Um, so starting with uh, this particular photo here, which I apologize, I can't remember who submitted this. Oh, it looks like Caroline submitted this one. Um, you know, 
when I'm first looking at a photo like this, I'm really looking at what are the opportunities to draw out the focus. And obviously it's a little harder when you're not the one that actually took the photo, because uh, I don't know what the intent was necessarily or what might have drawn their eye in or what have you. This one, it's pretty clear. It's the mountain range in the background here. But you know, for me, from a processing standpoint, I've shifted things significantly over the last few years. I used to do a lot more uh, very detailed, fine work what have you, whereas these days I'm more about let's get in and get out and get back out in the field and do some shooting or, or work on some other things. But still coming in, generally what I'm looking at is kind of what I call prepping the canvas, so to speak. So, you know, I'll start out by coming into an image and I'll look at the profile options here. So I'll go into my profile panel, which you can grab right here, profile right now, it's on camera landscape. I'll come in here and generally I go between two different ones that I'm working in color, either the Adobe landscape or the camera matching landscape, which is what this one's on already. Obviously you've got your different black and white ones in that too, but I'll take a look at these different ones and see kind of as a starting point, which one do I prefer? A lot of times, especially with Canon files, I find that the Adobe landscape works a little bit better because the Canon ones can get a little, a little punchy sometimes, especially with uh, greens and blues. So I'm gonna bump this over to the Adobe one close back out of this. Generally speaking for my own shooting and the types of things I shoot, I usually bump the white balance to daylight and then bump the purples up. Whoops, got a little excited there. Bump the purples up to 15. So it puts the temperature at 5,500 and the tent at plus 15. It's generally a pretty neutral starting point for shooting in daylight. From here, typically I actually drop the exposure a little bit which we can see right away, I'm getting some detail back in those clouds that wasn't there to begin with. And then I almost always drop the contrast slider between minus 15 to minus 30, depending on the image. Uh, this actually takes it down to matching roughly what the contrast slider several years ago used to be, and then Adobe changed their algorithms and the zero setting on contrast is now equivalent of about negative 25. But the reason I do that is I want to have more control over the contrast in the image than what that slider is giving me, which we'll get into in a moment here. Um, so that's pretty much where I start. So I get my profile set, I get my white balance set, and then I kind of prep the canvas in terms of the exposure and that contrast setting. And then I leave the rest of the sliders alone for the time being. One thing you might notice too, if you're familiar with Lightroom Classic is my panels may be in a different order than what yours are. If you right click on these, you can customize the panel, which lets you customize the order and actually hide panels if you want to. And I've also got solo mode turned on, which means only one panel is gonna be open at a, at, at a time as I'm working. So if it looks different, that is why. So once I'm done with the basic panel, the initial steps in there, I'll jump into tone curve. And this is where I start managing my contrast a little bit. So what I'm looking for here is kind of setting my white point and my black point and if you hit your J key on your keyboard and watch your histogram, these little boxes in the upper left and upper right either have a white border on them or not. When they've got the white border, that means you're seeing your clipping warnings in the image. So in terms of shadows, anything blue means you're losing detail there. Essentially, you've got a solid black. And if you had reds anywhere, that would be your highlights clipping out. So I'm basically looking for setting my white and black point as much as I can without actually introducing clipping or too much clipping. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter depending on the image if you've got a little bit in there or not. I've already got some clipping in the black, so I'm not gonna touch that right now. And then again, depending on the image, I might do a little bit of a subtle S curve uh, to add in some mid-tone contrast. But a lot of times these days I'm doing that within masking now and doing localized contrast that way. Once I get my tone curve set, I come into calibration. This is a little trick I use to manage my colors. You'll notice that on the basic panel, I actually didn't do anything with saturation or vibrance in terms of the sliders in that panel. I do almost all of my color saturation, for lack of a better way to put it, work within this calibration panel. And this is changing the balance of colors within the individual pixels. I've got a video on this for the sake of time. I'm not gonna go all into it. But generally for an image like this, for a basic landscape image, I'm gonna bump my blues up around 25 to 35. And if I do this quite extremely, hopefully you can see in the zoom uh, feed here that the colors are getting a little punchier. They get a little bit more luminosity in the colors. If I reset this back, you can see it fades back out a little bit. So it's just a nice way to get a very balanced little boost to your colors 
that works a little bit differently than what the saturation and, and vibrance uh, sliders do in that basic panel. Sometimes I'll mess with the red and the green, again, depending on the image, but this one, I'm gonna stick with the blues. Once I'm done with my calibration, I might come into my color mixer, uh, which we've actually got some new tools in here. So if I feel like perhaps the greens are a little too muted in here, or uh, maybe a little too punchy in terms of the greenness, and I wanna shift them to a little bit more towards the yellow, I might come in here and do that. Or you've got the new point color tool now, uh, which again, not to selfish, selfishly uh, self-promote, but I, I just put out a video on this. <laughs> Stop laughing, John. Just put out a 30 minute video on point color, all the ins and outs of how that works. This is a brand new tool that just hit last week with the latest updates. Basically allows you to select colors in 3D is the simplest way to put it. So whereas HSL, you can only adjust the hue based selections or the color of it. This allows you to select a color selection based on the hue, the saturation, and the brightness or darkness of the color range. Either way, I might come in here and let me, uh, maybe I want to add a little bit of yellow into those greens because I think they're a little too punchy and maybe I want to lift them up a little bit, so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm stepping through it kind of step by step in terms of building up the image as far as how I want it. In this particular one, uh, the next thing I would do most likely is come in and start working on that sky. Cause obviously there's detail in there, but we're kind of losing it right now with the uh, the exposure on this image, which is fine. We know the data is there. Uh, we just need to pull it back in. So I'm gonna create a sky mask and it'll detect the sky. <clears throat> if I hover on that now, you can see where I've got my selection made. And conveniently in my masking panel, I've already got the curve section opened up. So this is again, a relatively new addition in the last six months or so where you've got the ability to do curves and masks in Lightroom now. And again, I'm kind of looking to set my white and black points in this sky now, in the sky mask. But I'll also come in and use the target adjustment tool, which is this little circle icon. And I'll grab, generally speaking, a brighter tone, not the brightest, but a brighter tone, and maybe pull it up. So if I click and hold on that part of the image and drag my mouse up, I'm increasing the curve upwards, which means I'm adding brightness into it. And then I'll come out and select a darker part of the sky here and click and drag down. And you can see now I'm adding some contrast back into those clouds that weren't there in the original raw file. You can also see I'm adding in a lot of blue by the very nature of adding contrast. You also typically are gonna get some saturation boost in your colors, which you may not want. So part of the uh, updates within the last six months is you also have this refined saturation slider on the tone curve tool which if you slide this to the left, that's gonna pull out some of that added saturation. Uh, you do have to be careful because sometimes it can mess with the curve itself. It's not changing the curve, but you can see you start getting some different clipping than you were before, just because of the way it all works behind the scene, so to speak. So you might have to do some additional kind of tweaking and, and playing with it. But if I turn this on and off, now you can see with that one adjustment in this mask, I've added in a fairly significant amount of contrast that we didn't have before. Uh, and Linda, keep me honest on time. I didn't I didn't look at the clock to see when I started. I want to try to keep this no more than 10 minutes to give John a chance for some reason. <laughs> He's going to need more than that. <laughs> uh, other than that here, so actually I shouldn't have closed it. I'm asking. So right now, I think the sky, you know, I might, if, uh, if I had more time, I might work on that contrast a little bit more and, and get a little bit more drama in there, maybe work on the mountain. But otherwise, I would say right now from where we're at, the landscape itself is probably a little little darker than what I would want. So that's where I could come in here again. And I can, since I've got this sky mask here for simplicity's sake, I can just right click on it and choose duplicate, duplicate and invert. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna take that sky mask, duplicate it, but then invert it so that now I've got a landscape mask nice and easily. And now I can work on the landscape portion of the image. So again, I might wanna add some contrast in, but I'm already close to clipping those on the mountain in the snow. So I'm just gonna leave that be. And I'm gonna look for where are my tones that I wanna brighten up. And it's really in this main foreground area here. So maybe I use my target tool and I can lighten up this kind of gravel a little bit and pull that up. But I don't wanna reduce my contrast too much. So come into the shadowed area a little bit here, maybe pull that back down but we still have some shadow clipping. So let me go into my tone panel and see if I can get rid of that by bumping up my shadows. I can, although it's starting to brighten up 
the whole thing that I don't necessarily want. So I would probably do in that case is come in with a separate mask and use a brush and just target those specific little areas that are clipping to see if there's any detail in there I want to pull out. But you know, something like this, where if I hit the J key and turn off that clipping warning, you know, that's basically it should be black because it's a very, very shadowed area of the image. So I probably wouldn't worry about something like that. Where I'd be worried would be maybe some of this clipping in here where you know maybe I'm losing a little bit of detail that I would want to pull back out again with a brush and either bumping the exposure or pulling the shadow slider up or using a curve and uh, addressing it that way. It just depends, again, what part of the image is clipping, what you're looking for from your total style or overall style and looking to achieve out of it. And, you know, even difference of I'm going to be sharing this on social media versus I'm going to be printing it. You know, you've got to adjust things a little bit differently there too. So um, <clears throat> that's a very quick and dirty uh, again, Linda, if you want, I can stop here and we can jump over to John so he can show his approach. I'll, you know, we'll be doing a, at least a couple other photos, I think. But uh, yeah, but yeah. That, I mean, that's a that, that's kind of a nice little before. Can you take us to your before and after shot? Yes, I can. <clears throat> so if I hit the Y key, I get my nice yeah side by side. So you can see the colors are a little punchier. And, and just looking at this again, this is such a quick and dirty approach to it to, <laughs> to go through my workflow. But you know, I think those greens are actually a little too punchy in the foreground. So I would do some more work there. I'd probably do some brushing on this tree up here with a mask uh, to lift the shadows a little bit. It's looking a little dark and heavy in that upper corner, kind of pulling the eye. I might work on the mountain uh, in a mask to work on pulling some contrast in the snow details and things like that. But for my very high level, that's the general workflow I go through is kind of building up uh, step by step and getting to the end version. But also, and yeah, you know, I think everybody probably approaches it this way, but once I do my masking and you know other tools within here, it doesn't mean I never go back to my basic panel just because that's the first thing I do. You know, I might come in here and say, well, I want to add some whites in or I want to lift the shadows over globally or whatever. You know, it's, you, it's all iterative and you just work it and massage it and get it to where you want, uh, depending on which panel you need to use. Sounds great. That looks great too. Big difference. Yep. Thanks, Michael. All right, John Fisher. Yes, I will share my screen. And let me get this photo up. All right, a very similar approach in the Lightroom portion of my any workflow to what Michael Rung did. Um, the main difference is, for me, is I'm approaching this in a section-by-section section, um, area um, in the photo. So, you know, this is the original photo that Michael Ring started with. Um, this is the before. And basically what I realized looking at this is that I wanted to edit in two different areas. I wanted it, one edit in Lightroom for the upper area of the mountain in the sky. And then I wanted a separate edit for the foreground because as I was editing for the sky, I was getting effects in the foreground I didn't like and vice versa. I couldn't find that balance and I wanted to be able to refine these things in a very specific way for the foreground versus the sky. So I was basically the first thing I did was I made a duplicate copy and I started editing them separately, one for the foreground and one for the sky. And for the sky version here, basically I dropped the highlights all the way down so I could get as much detail in the sky and the mountain as I could. Um, brought my shadows up to get a lot of that detail in the tree over here that Michael Rung was talking about. And um, just went through a little bit of dehaze. Uh, unlike Michael, I add a little bit of saturation typically, or actually negative saturation, a little bit of additional vibrance. Um, in the tone curves, very similar to him. I do a little bit of work in here. Um, mostly I bring up the highlights just a little bit. I like this light slider, um, just to kind of turn the lights on a little bit in the image. And like Michael again, I do a lot of work in the calibration panel to do a lot of that color saturation work to really bring the color out. Um, if I click this eyeball here and turn it on and off, you can see just how much more color there is in this image for an off versus on. Um, again, very similar to what Michael was doing is a lot of times those blues get too rich when the calibration gets bumped up, especially when you're working with these uh, blue primary. 
So the only thing I typically do is bring that blue back down a little bit. And that's mostly what I did for this upper section. Um, likewise, then on the foreground, I wanted it much more punchy. I wanted a lot more contrast in there that the reduction of the highlights in the first edit was not allowing me to get. Um, but on the flip side, when I added all this foreground contrast, if I hit my J key, you can see just how much white clipping I have in the sky. Why is this not a problem? Because when I get into Photoshop, I'm going to combine these two together with a layer mask, and I will only get the foreground part that I want and the sky out of the other image. So let me switch over here to Photoshop and find the correct image. So these are the two images that I already loaded over here because it does take a minute to load into Photoshop. So here's the first edit with all the nice sky detail. And then here's our foreground edit. And how detailed of a mask you want to create here is really up to you and the image itself. Uh, for this one, because this, you know, kind of border transition zone is kind of soft and it's, you know, I'm mostly just interested in the foreground, the very front foreground here. I can probably go in here with just a fairly easy rest of my see. I got this one on top, yes. So I want to make a mask and I want to basically brush out with a black brush at a very high saturation and flow and opacity. Basically, I just want to paint in my more detailed, contrasty, and a little bit cooler of a tone, now I see them on top of each other, of a foreground. So all this is doing is just bringing in that lower image, letting it paint, see, um, show through because this is now black on this mask. And this is just a really easy painted in brush. And the simplest kind of mask, this is as simple as it can be. And it can get as detailed as you want to be. If you've got like a ridge line here that you want to get very specific on, you want to get that, you know, edge right on the line, which you can do is come up here to select, select sky. Give it a second, it'll automatically fill this line. So I'm all I'm really interested in is this far left edge here. I'm going to go back into my mask and I want to make sure I'm painting white and I can make sure that anything that was actually it's the inverse there. So control shift inverse. So this is the edge I want and be painting black. Yeah. And then deselect control D and you can see here. Now I got a real sharp edge here. I went a little bit over there. I can always easily just paint that with back to white. So masks are infinitely customizable, infinitely refinable. You can always go back and adjust them however you want endlessly until you get just the way you want it. So that was a real quick layer in there for those two things. And looking over here now, I've got my punchy foreground. Uh, with a little bit cooler, a little bit different color tone, and then my really nice detailed sky. But the colors are just a little bit dull here. So one thing I like to do, so I will hit Control, Shift, Alt, and E to make a stamp visible layer, if it'll let me. Why aren't you working? There it goes. Okay, so basically this is just taking all the layers and combine them into one. And real quickly, I'm going to pop over to Nick Collection. This is Color Effects Pro 4. It's a nice plug-in for Photoshop or Lightroom. The benefit of using it in Photoshop is that you can then mask it and do a lot of other things with it to just put these effects where you want. When I first started using it, I was only working in Lightroom, I would get this and there was no way to ease, more easily refine that back into the original image and only put it where I wanted it. And this is just a real quick, just a little bit of a brightening effect and a little bit of a warming effect through the sky. Just very subtle, but it kind of brightens and lifts the tones a little bit. When I come back over into Photoshop, this is going to be a new layer right up on top with those changes that I made over in Nick. It's going to take a minute.
So I've got this much brighter, more lifted image, but it's getting a little too bright in the highlights. So I really only want to target this lifting into the, the mid-tone area. I want it to not affect the darkest areas and the lightest areas. So for this, I would make a luminosity mask. And to do that very quickly, I can use the, uh, what I use is TK Rapid Mask. I'm still on a very old version 6. Uh, Lumenzi is another very good um, tool for this as a plug-in for Photoshop. I'm just going to click on these wide mid-tones, and it gives me a mask. That looks like this. So this is deselecting the brightest areas here and the darkest areas here and everything white is going to be what's selected. So this is going to basically limit this layer to just those tones in the mid range of the luminosity. I'm just going to hit apply and now I've got this layer just brightening those mid tones and brightening them up a little bit. And then if I just deselect the mask it gives everything. So you can very subtly see where it's just confining this change just a little bit to those mid-tone areas. Um, let's cheat here real quick and see what I did before. Just real quick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just for sake of time. Um, so from here, I'm just going to probably do a little bit of dodging and burning work uh, just to kind of refine the shadows and push in the eye into that mountain just a little bit. Uh, so for dodging and burning, I usually use either a blank mask set to overlay if I want more of a punchy effect, more highlight, more shadow, or soft light if I want the effect to be a little bit softer, a little bit more muted. Um, this is just going to be a real quick, just general, not really a, a vignette, but just kind of a darkening of certain areas, and it's going to be just to certain areas, not really a circular effect like a vignette would be. So I'm just going to take a soft brush here at a much lower opacity than 100%, usually somewhere around 20% if I can get this thing to listen to me. Why aren't you? Okay. Sometimes it doesn't like listening to me. It's not the only one, John. Yes, I know. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Opacity 20, flow 20 is usually what I use for these just generally smooth effects. And I'm just going to paint here in the sky just a little bit just to darken up the very edges. Just real softly, very subtly. It's a lot easier to go over multiple times than have one pass that's way too strong. And you can just kind of build it in into certain areas where you want the clouds just a little bit darker. And here. And come down to the very bottom just a little bit around the edge. So this way I can just affect the very bottom corner over here or a much broader area across the top to start bringing in the viewer's eye into the area of the image that I want them to look at. So this rock over here on the far left is a little dark, so we'll paint over it a couple times with this black brush on soft light. And just kind of reduce how much that rock draws the eye over in the corner. And then some of these shadowy areas I'll paint in darker just to add a little extra, you know, lines, you know, leading line almost bringing you forward into the image. You can kind of paint almost a leading line into the image if you've got some shadows already there. So with that, I just kind of bring that, okay, that bottom edge might be a little bit much. So let's we'll come over here and paint out a little bit. And then likewise, if I wanted to lift certain areas, I come in with an overlay, set it to white, and I can make a smaller brush. Again, it won't listen to me. I blame Zoom. There we go. And then I can just paint in a few areas with a white brush. Oh, that's would help if I'm using the right tool. I'm trying to go quickly here so I can let Michael get back to his Lightroom demonstration and we get a little more a back and forth to get more techniques demonstrated. But with this brush on overlay, just kind of painting in the highlights and the uh, brighter areas that I want to kind of let the eye more get drawn to in the center of the image. So this ridge line here, 
maybe a little bit in the original line up here on the mountain. Anywhere that's a lighter area that I want to kind of lift and help bring the eye into. That's more the center of the image. Away from the exterior. That just helps bring the eye in and keep the eye in your image longer. So that's on and off of this overlay layer. Um, Paint a little bit here on the tree helps lift those shadows a little bit more and get a little bit more detail in there and make it more of a feature element than just something that's a dark blob on the corner. And because this doesn't affect really dark so much because the way overlay works, um, you know, I don't have to mask too carefully. If for some reason started making too much of a you know white halo around, say if I paint out here too much and make you know the, the sky actually too bright, I could always mask this again, put a mask on this layer to um, not select this brighter area. So let's just do that real quick so you can see. You know, say I just punch this up to 100% so you can really kind of see. So maybe I got really sloppy with my brush way out here and that looks like you know awfulness. So I just want to exclude that completely. So I can do is make a selection of the highlights, the whites area. So that can do that. And then apply that to there. If I inverse it, it basically would mask just to, to the round that tree where only the darker areas get affected. It's a really sloppy mask, but it kind of demonstrates how you don't always have to be really exact with your brush if you then use a mask to only select the areas that you wanted to uh, select. Let me do that a little bit better. Let me delete that and get rid of you. And then let's go to whites. Actually, let's make a mask that is all there. All there. I'm again, moving too quickly for my own good. So there's the on again. Let's select those whites. And that's time I'm just going to paint out that area around there. So it's going to go with selection, hide the marching ants, black brush, and I can just paint I delete my anyways, this thing's acting weird on me. Um, there's a little bit of a rush through, but it kind of demonstrates a different idea of using a dual processing technique in Lightroom that is then combined in Photoshop and then lets you refine and build on top of that dual editing process in Photoshop. And with that, back to Michael. So real quick, um, uh, yes. John, somebody asked, Johnny Window, why do you stamp visible layers? Can you answer that? The stamp visible layer basically takes all the layers below it that you're seeing and puts it on one layer. Say, so, you know, over here, I've got a bunch of different layers, but there's just a little bit of, you know, there's not everything combined. I'm looking through multiple layers to see what I'm seeing on the screen. But if I want to take it, export it into Nick and to another program, if I just export this top layer, all I'm going to get is a white screen or you know some black or something that looks like this if i don't stamp visible and combine all those layers into one pixel layer that then can be exported into another program like nick uh, color effects silver effects uh, their define program any of the topaz uh, you want all those pixels combined to go into those other programs okay thank you yep. all right um michael do you want to come back Michael, yep. why don't you skip, I think the next one you guys had was that little house on the hill. Why don't you skip that one for now? And in, in, because of lack of time here. Okay. I can do that. Let me get Sharon again. It's amazing how fast doing editing fast can go. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we're not, uh, getting too fast and losing people. All right, so let me make sure this is reset because I was playing with it earlier, it is. All right, so this one I like with the drama in the sky and then also this nice color contrast between the warmth of the rock formation and then the dirt and the foreground here, even with the trees versus that kind of blue tones in the sky. So same approach, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna decide 
right now we're on camera standard. Uh, likely that's what it was shot at. Um, so do I want to start with Adobe Landscape or camera landscape? And actually in this one, I think I like the camera one a little bit more. It gives a little bit more punch to that rock formation, which is what I'm looking. You can see that the sky does get a little blue, so I'll have to address that. So let me just apply this. The white balance on this one, uh, if I remember correctly, I actually left this as shot uh, doing my usual daylight one. Didn't quite, uh, oops, didn't quite balance things out correctly. Again, I'm going to bring the exposure down just a little bit uh, to work with this in my tone curves and more localized editing, but not too much. You can see it's subtle, which is one of my big mantras, kind of subtle, 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 do things subtly as opposed to going hog wild with it. And oftentimes I'll make an adjustment, even back it off uh, right away, because uh, when I come back to it, I know that I'm probably going to think it's a little garish and overdone. So again, I've got my basic panel set. I'm going to come into the tone curve. I've already hit the J key to turn on my clipping warnings for highlights and shadows. So I'm going to set those white and black points. And this is kind of why I'm bringing that exposure down, because I'm bringing brightness back into the image through the tone curve here just by setting these points. And I'm starting to get some clipping down in the trees. So I'm not going to do a whole lot there. And on this one, uh, I might do a little bit of mid-tone. Again, very subtle. But you can see just with that single adjustment how much of a difference we've got in this scene already. The next thing, again, is I'll come into calibration. And I'll look at bumping this blue, but here's a great example of where the blue slider isn't necessarily the one I want. So those blues in the sky are already really strong, and I know I'm going to have to address that. And by shifting the balance of blue pixels with this calibration panel, I'm just making that even worse. So I'm going to cancel that out. And what I really want is to help this formation pop, because that's a, obviously the main focal point of the landscape. So I'm going to come up to my red slider and see what I can do to help that pop out a little bit without going too crazy. Obviously, you can go really garish with it and uh, and not take that subtle approach. So somewhere right around there, I think looks good. And then I'll go into my color mixer. And on this one, there's a couple things I want to adjust. I want to add a little bit of punchiness to the trees in the foreground here. I think they frame it pretty nicely. So I'm going to take my eyedropper tool on this new point color. I realize some of you may not be familiar with this tool yet because it is brand new. But if I come out here and select a point of color that I want to adjust, now I've got my swatch and I can start dragging around the circle in here to determine what kind of adjustment I want to do, whether I want to go more towards the yellow range. I'm going to actually use the sliders on this for a little bit more control. I want to actually brighten these. So I'm just going to add a little bit of punchiness there. And I don't think the hue needs to adjust. So really, I'm just looking to adjust the luminance of that selection I just made. And then I'm going to also look at visualize range and see if I can get this narrowed down a little bit, which this is really the power of this new point color is I can try to pull out these colored areas here, what's being impacted. So obviously the trees are being impacted mostly, but part of the kind of sandy soil landscape is getting pulled into this as well. So can I pull this out either using my range slider and narrowing the range a little bit, which looks like it's doing a pretty good job. Um, also, I might want to pull out some of the hue of the oranges. So it's just working with this, kind of massaging it again back and forth to determine how I can narrow that range up a little bit and make sure I'm only impacting those trees for the most part. And now we've got a before and after of this. You can see it's still impacting the landscape a little bit. So in perfect world, I'd probably come in with a mask and do point color within a localized mask. So I'm truly only getting the trees. But again, you can see a relatively simple adjustment, helping those trees pop out a little bit more and balance that landscape out. The other thing I can do is you can do up to eight different color swatches on the point color. So maybe I come out to this rock formation and I select those oranges. And again, maybe I want to punch up the brightness on that a little bit because it's in sunlight, it looks like. So bump that a bit. Maybe we bump the saturation just a smidge. And again, just very subtle adjustments to help that thing really start jumping out and make that the emphasis of the screen. I'm doing a little bit over on this just for the sake of uh, helping it show up on Zoom. But you get the point. Just two really, primarily what I've done so far that have made the biggest differences is the tone curve and then 
that color mixer adjustment or those two color mixer adjustments. The other thing I do with color mixer is I could use this to come in and attack the blues. Um, it's going to pull out the blues and the landscape as well, which is a little strong. So let me bump back in here and we'll just pick a blue tone and we can desaturate that a little bit. We don't lose the atmospheric haze back here, but we lose that really heavy blue tone that was introduced uh, with some of the other adjustments I've done. So I can kind of balance that out. But again, ultimately what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another sky mask, just like I did in the last one. And let it do its thing, make the selection. I can do a quick hover to feel or to gauge whether it did a good job of masking, and it has. And again, what I'm going to do here is First, I'm looking at, I want to increase the drama in the sky. So I'm going to look at pulling in the white point a little bit. Although the right edge is actually pretty close to clipping, so we'll tackle that a different way. But I can definitely pull in the left side. And you can see now I'm getting all this drama added in with a relatively minor adjustment. Again, I can use this target adjustment tool, which is the circular icon here. And now I can come out and kind of pick, again, not my brightest, tones because I don't want to lift those up anymore because they're so close to clipping but maybe like right in here I can pull that up a little bit and it's pulling up the darks as well which I don't want necessarily so again I can come back into kind of a mid-range tone and pull that back down again we're getting a lot of blues so I can use the refined saturation slider to pull some of those blues out but even I pull this all the way over a it's introducing some clipping over there on the right as I pull the color out but even if I pull it all the way over, it's still a little, it's not terrible, but maybe it's a little blue there. So let me pull this back up a bit and I can tackle this just with a general adjustment. I could either look at maybe warming the sky up a little bit to offset the blues, or obviously I could pull out saturation, which is gonna take those blues out a bit as well. And then I'll come back into my curve. Maybe I wanna pull those, oops, pull those darker tones back down a little bit, just Let's go really dramatic with this kind of stormy looking sky. And uh, again, just a few quick, simple adjustments and we've got a pretty nice balance. Now, I've probably gone over the top on what I've done with the landscape here. So again, this is where I say it's iterative. I, I make an adjustment and then that can change the entire balance of the image. So maybe I need to come back into my main global adjustments and go to that color mixer panel again, select the orange um, selection I made or the orange swatch. And let me pull that luminance back down, maybe darken that back up a little bit to get a little better balance. Maybe actually pull that saturation down into the negatives just a smidge. Again, just going by feel here, what looks right. And one thing I always do, which I can't do for the sake of the demo is I'll step away for half an hour, several hours, days, weeks. I, don't necessarily go that extreme anymore these days, but I'll step away, give my give my eyes a chance to kind of reset because you kind of start going blind to the image after a while. And I'll come back with it fresh eyes. And again, maybe I come back to this tomorrow and I go, oh, you know, I think I pulled those oranges down too much and I'll bump the oranges back up. So again, it's give and take, but the fresh eyes thing is, is probably the biggest thing I can do. Uh, the other thing I would do is use my color grading. I don't always use this just for color. A lot of times I'll use the luminance slider on its own just to look at what I can use that for to add in some contrast or pull contrast out. So like here as an example, A, it helps me see what part of the, the image is gonna be impacted by this shadows part of the color grading, but I'm actually getting some nice contrast added in with this. So maybe I do pull this down negative a little bit, but oftentimes what I'll do with the shadows too is I'll add a little bit of blue in. Again, really low saturation. I usually only do five or seven points, five to seven points of saturation uh, to add just a little bit of coolness to the shadows. Cause again, that's gonna kind of fade them into the background a little bit. And pretty subtle, but hopefully you can see as I'm turning this on and off, there is just that little bit of difference in terms of the contrast in the landscape, as well as adding a little bit more depth and darkness into the sky. And then I'll come over to my midtones selection, same thing. What can I get by dropping or raising the luminance in the midtones? Again, I think if we look at that's the baseline, maybe pull it back just a smidge. Again, very subtle. I don't want to go over the top. Usually on the midtones, quite frankly, I don't do any color adjustments. Again, it's always going to vary from image to image. But a lot of times I'm literally just coming into the midtones part of color grading strictly for that luminance slider 
to get a little extra punchiness. And again, very subtle. I don't want to go over the over the top crazy with it, but just making that nice, again, building upon each step and uh, building the image up to what I want it to be. And again, I can use the luminance slider for the highlights portion. I'm usually pretty subtle with this because it works uh, differently than say using your highlight slider, exposure slider, or whites. It's a different uh, algorithm in terms of how it's adjusting the lighter tones. So I tend to be pretty pretty cautious with the luminance slider on the whites. And then oftentimes I will add a little bit of warmth into the highlights as well. So this is kind of the old split toning trick where you're adding warmth into your highlights, coolness into your shadows, but again, still very subtle, very low uh, low saturation range. So you can see, well, I can see it. I don't know that you can see the difference. <laughs> it's that subtle, but just really, really subtly building this up. If I turn the entire color grading panel on and off, you can see a little bit more. It's got a little bit more punch in terms of contrast and a little bit of that cool versus warm balance between the highlights and the shadows. As far as effects go, you know, John showed his approach to vignetting. Um, Again, it depends on the image. Sometimes I do global vignetting. This is an image where I wouldn't because I think it's way too heavy over here. It's a little heavy over here. Um, so I take a very similar approach with, with uh, what John showed, except I do it in Lightroom masking. So I would come in here and I'm gonna hold down my control and shift or command and shift buttons. And then I can drag left to zoom way out. And I'm just gonna come in, create a new mask. I'm gonna grab a brush. And I want a very low flow. So I've got my B brush. I just usually keep around 25 on the flow. And generally speaking, I'm looking, maybe I'll bump the exposure down a smidge. I'll pull the shadows down a smidge. I've actually got a, a custom preset that I made for masking for a vignette. Uh, so I can select that as well. Uh, and it's a little bit more aggressive. And I paint this in, whoops. I, point, I paint this in very gingerly. Again, much like John was within Photoshop, I am using a very large brush with a very low flow. I've got my feather turned all the way up and I'm really only gonna be working with the feather portion of this. I went and made my brush too big, but again, I'm just kind of kissing the edges of the image to John's point to help draw the eye in centrally a little bit compared to where we started off. But now by doing it with the brush like this, again, uh, I'll, I'll actually give John credit, but <laughs> I can control where I'm applying it as opposed to it being applied on all four corners, essentially as that global vignette tool does. Now, if I turn this on and off, you can see it's subtle. I'm mainly addressing this brightness. I felt that brightness in the upper right was a little too much. So I wanted to bring that down a little bit to keep the eye from drifting up there. Maybe add a little bit more on the bottom part down here, but otherwise I'm just helping guide the eye to where I want it to be. And if I hold down my space bar and click on it, now I can zoom it back out and look at the before and after there. So again, you can see it's just a very subtle way of helping control where the viewer's eye is gonna go. Uh, let's see, anything else on this particular one? Again, I'd probably come in, I wanna necessarily look at adding contrast in the background of the landscape, because that's going to take away some of the depth of the scene and, and compete with this a little bit. So I don't know that I would do a whole lot else to this particular image. Like I said, I probably, for that tree adjustment I did, I might do that in masking, so I'm not having to worry about impacting any of this landscape. I think as it is right now, it looks pretty good. If I do before and after, there's where we started, and there's where we're at now. So you can see a lot more drama in the sky and a lot more punchiness in that uh, that foreground landscape to really help that rock formation jump out at us. But my goal is always, I want to help convey what I saw and experienced and felt without going too crazy and, and misrepresenting what the scene was. And this may not be totally accurate to it. It doesn't mean I'm going for a one-to-one -one representation of the scene, but a one-to-one -one representation of how I felt the scene, if that makes sense. And we can do side by side as well by hitting the Y key. So you can see again, a lot more drama and interest in the sky now compared to where we started off. Uh, and I think on this one, that is pretty much what I would do on this one. I, I like this image a lot, actually. 
I not that I didn't like the other one, but I'm always a sucker for a big red rock like that. I'm, I'm going back to Utah in a few weeks, and I'll be looking at a lot of that stuff. <laughs> I can remember how many times you pointed at the red rocks as we drove through Utah on our way to Oregon, and you're like, I want to stop. I want to stop. I want to stop. I want to stop. <laughs> There's a reason I'm going back to Utah for the third time in 18 months. <laughs> All right. John, this is what I'm thinking because we are running out of time. Yes. Um, how about you jump to the um, other photo and do an edit on that? And okay. The Mount Rainier we're... shot of Kathy's? Yes. Okay. That is excellent sure. idea because it does demonstrate another um, technique that I use a lot. And actually, Kathy did a good job of getting it started or actually done. So this is an excellent example of what's called an exposure blend, where you take two images that have different exposure uh, situations or better images um, in certain areas of the photo that you want to combine. And Kathy actually did a great job of this. So this is the brighter image that we started with that she had for the foreground. It's got a lot more detail and a lot less noise than the super dark first image that we'd received. Um, so she did an excellent job of combining this one with a darker image that had a lot more interest up here in the sky. So this first one is very blight. There's not any clouds up here to speak of, but the foreground's got a lot more uh, detail. So you combine these two with, again, a fairly simple but effective mask, just to combine the two together. Uh, again, you could use luminosity masks. You can do a, lot, do a lot of different type of masking effects to get a much more refined mask. But for this uh, image, this works perfectly fine, and it gets the job done of giving us an image that has a brighter foreground that's got less noise, and then the more interesting sky and not a blown out sky that we can then work with. And looking at this photo, it looks like it's a you know blue hour, just beginning to get sunlight, a little bit in those high clouds, uh, still very you know dusk or sunrise kind of effect. So we wanna kind of maintain that. We don't wanna to go too overboard with the punchiness, especially in the sky, because there's just, you know, it's one of those times a day where there's not a lot of light. However, we've also got these really nice flowers in the foreground. We want those to be kind of the star of the show alongside, of course, Mount Rainier, this nice little bit of light in the sky and this nice bit of trees. So we're going to try to play with those different elements a little bit in a way that we treat each one again separately, but then won't affect those other areas of the image where you might have problems because it would be too much in certain areas. Um, so we're going to go through this relatively quickly. So I'm going to do this. So we're going to take a empty pixel layer. We're going to set it to, first we're going to do a little bit of soft light just to lift the shadows just a little bit kind of more evenly. Um, what I want to do is since there's kind of this nice kind of almost a purplish haze over the scene. Find a color in the image. Maybe it's kind of dusky rose color. Make sure I'm set at a very low opacity and flow. And I'm just gonna paint in here just a little bit, just to brighten up the areas just a little bit, introduce a little bit of color since I'm adding both color with this, you know, a bit of color, um, hue and also a little bit of brightness in here just to soften everything up just a little bit in the foreground just put a little more light in there but we're going to leave that sky completely on its own maybe just a couple of clicks over the mountain just to put a little more of that soft you know ethereal glow around the horizon so that's just a little bit of lifting it might be a little bit too much in certain areas especially i think it's getting a little warm with that pinkish hue so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make a mask and I'm gonna use this TK panel real quick just to pick the darker areas, make that a selection. So basically it's now made a selection based on that luminosity mask instead of just applying it. I'm gonna hide these pixels with Control H and I can come in here and paint with a black mask and just remove it a little bit from the darker areas that might have been just a wee bit too much of an effect. So we can just kind of, you know, put it in and then bring it back out just a little bit in the darker areas. 
if I click over here with control click, then you can see my maps that I've basically created with that selection. And as I will attempt not to do, which I always do, is remember to deselect with control D. So I've now deselected that selection that I hid. And now we've got this layer. And I'm going to come back in now with a quick overlay layer. I'm going to do pure white because I think that last layer had enough color in it. And I'm just going to, let's do a quick mask again. Just pick these flowers, just the brightest areas. I'm just going to straight up apply this. So that's going to make that, put that mask on this empty layer with white just a little bit. So I'm going to bring back my flow and opacity and just paint in the foreground just a little bit. And since I've already applied this mask to this layer, it's only going to affect those really bright areas. And it's going to bring these flowers to life. And I'm going to actually now pick the purple that's in here. Let me change it just a smidge. Pick a color about like that and paint it a few more times. Just give it a little extra saturation along with that brightness. And now as I'm painting, it's going to pick up a little bit into this pond back here. But as long as I don't go super bright, as long as the reflection is not brighter than the sky, we can probably get away with it. And again, maybe if we move this down just a little bit and paint a little bit into Rainier, just a small brush. Just pick up a little bit of extra Alpine Glow and color on Rainier back here, a little bit down in this foreground valley. Go forward and back on this. It's just, you know, it's brightening up that, it's cleaning up the color and that little bit of a dinginess almost that was in the uh, snow cap, making that a little brighter, making that more of a focal point of the image along with these nice flowers. So that's a real quick, you know, just clean up that foreground. Uh, if we had a little more time, what I'd probably continue is maybe then turn my attention to the sky a little bit. Try to bring up these pinks a little bit in the uh, sky. So let's, do, let's, see, let's see this mask real quick. So I'm selecting a bit of that pink more than the other stuff. So what I'll do real quick to see if we can get it. I'll pick this pink, go real bright. Just brush over this with an overlay layer just a little bit. I don't want to desaturate. One thing with overlay and these kind of these subtle things, you start losing a saturation unless you kind of pick more of a color. But it's kind of a balancing act to brighten the clouds without losing the saturation. And that picks up a fair bit. We are losing the blues a little bit behind there. So we'd probably make another layer for a little bit of soft light to then bring the blues and the darkness back into the background. And sometimes it's like Michael will say, it's an integral effect, either going back over the layers you created and refining them further with either changing the mask, refining the mask, or just painting back over or erasing. Or sometimes if it's too much, just reducing the opacity uh, itself. Um, let's see here. If I just do real quick, and then we'll wrap this up. Find this blue, go with kind of dark and just kind of paint along this top edge here, just to kind of bring a little more darkness. And again, helping that eye stay where we want it in the image, which is in your landscape and in the areas of the photo that you kind of want to be the, the focal points and the subjects of the image. Yeah, maybe just a little bit in there, just to kind of soften, make that you know early morning ethereal kind of first glow of day effect back there in the background. So this was where we started with the foreground image. We put in the better sky. That was a stamp visible layer. Again, basically taking those two first layers, combining them together into one pixel layer. Uh, if you wanted to go back into Camera Raw, you could use that to do that or into any other third party program that then would affect all the pixels in there. And we just use a couple of very simple dodge and burn layer, dodge and burn layers um, to, uh, you know, paint in areas where we want light, where we want a little more brightness, a little more color. Uh, we could go again the other direction with more contrast if there was areas we wanted to darken up. So it's just kind of, again, that layering effect that we kind of build up the edit and in different areas and very pinpointed and, you know, targeted selections. Nicely done. Thank you. 
And let me get you to take your screen down. Let me just scan to see if anybody has put any questions in here. Um, I'm sorry, we were running out of time and I didn't want you, I, and I noticed that um, there were still a couple of photos you didn't get to. Right. And I apologize for that. We're just, it takes a lot longer. Um, yeah, even I'm remember. sure Michael will agree, but you know, I sometimes spend 15, 20 minutes just in the <laughs> Lightroom portion of one, and then I'll get to the point where I need to make a another copy, edit a different area if I want to do a dual processing, or if I've got a focus stack, and then you know the, the Photoshop portion of my editing process can take you know between twenty minutes and multiple hours. What do you so mean? obviously this was a very high level, very quick, you know, demonstrate a few of the techniques that we go into, but the full workflow, especially when you get into the nitpicky of you know cleaning up distractions, you know, if I wanted to remove some of the walking paths, a couple of the people in the foreground, zooming out, finding the bigger distractions, then zooming in, finding the narrower distractions, just to kind of clean up the image. It's, you know, the iterative process does take a while. And you, like Michael says, you want to be able to step back, come back to it, you know, and just keep, you know, slowly refine that image until there's nothing to add, but also nothing to remove. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Kathy says we didn't do any cropping. We ain't got time for that. <laughs> uh, my actually the, in, the the photo that Michael had edited, um, I had actually cropped that down into a more of a three by four aspect ratio to make the red rock even more of a front and center, um, you know, star of the image. Um, but I did like the way he approached it too with the full size, and he got a little more drama and contrast out of those clouds that I had actually uh, cropped out portion of. Yeah, the only one I cropped when I was playing around beforehand was actually the one with the shed. Um, there's the a little the large dark... shed or the, uh, hills, the green hillside? The green hillside. Uh, the green there's hillside. a little like dark patch on the bottom. I pulled the crop up uh, a little bit. To... Yeah, I, that, 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 that very buck bottom corner, I, I know which dark corner you're talking about now, and I was playing with that one too. I actually ended up desaturating that after I did a whole bunch of crazy things and kind of came with an edit I liked, but it was, it was not the direction I first just wanted to go. That's one of those things is, as you get edit, you find a fork on the road, you kind of peer down and you're like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, this whole program was interesting, man. I feel like I spent an hour with a bunch of nerds. Well, you basically yes, you did. did. So. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, I don't spend this kind of time on editing my book, <laughs> which explains why I don't have, you know, the photos you do have, you guys have in your portfolios. Um, thank you for doing this. I might even like try to talk you into doing this again. We're down it wasn't... for it. Uh, I think we're down You're for it. We, we might need like the epic happiness hour where we all get drunk <laughs> and yeah. edit for like three hours. <laughs> What we, what we really need is John to work in Photoshop and me just critiquing how you could do all of that in Lightroom. The same. <laughs> I, I was biting my tongue a couple of points. <laughs> but John, John. <laughs> no, some, some of the techniques that you showed and some of the new tools that are coming out with Lightroom are very interesting and very powerful. I will admit that they've come a long way with what you can do in Lightroom since I first branched into Photoshop most heavily. So I'll say they've they've removed a lot of the barriers that made me go into Photoshop. Yeah, the last couple of years they've done a lot. I will be yeah. the first to admit, which is why I go back to some of my older photos and rework them. <laughs> well guys, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I know you guys were actually working on this before we even um, had to you know get on Zoom. So yep. I appreciate the time that you guys gave up because I know <laughs> both of you had other stuff to do. So I truly appreciate it. All right, I'm going to link all their contact information um, to the notes when I post this to YouTube. Next week, Tom Schwabel will be joining us to share his presentation, Astrophotography, the big picture to the distant details. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.